Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ad Shmerni, PhD thesis. I think Ad is unique in many ways. Uh, he left uh, a very lucrative career in Wall Street to pursue a PhD uh, in my lab. He's a very talented mathematician and uh, he likes to also play the hardware with mixed success. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he Turned out is a very talented uh, uh, Arduino Frisbee player, and this quality was instrumental to let our lab to extort <laughs> <the> point <laughs> of victory <laughs> against uh, Michael Lab. <laughs> we also unique in some aspects that maybe are less uh, positive, I would say. For example, I thought that the Italians were exemplifying the notion of being last minute, but I think Ed has a little bit of notion of being uh, last minute. Anyway, yeah. so in his PhD, he has worked on a bunch of problems related to robotics, in particular how to quantify uncertainty uh, for the control of uh, of cells. And uh, he has a number of results that are, I think, quite exciting, and I look forward to hear to your discussion. Thanks. Yeah, first I'd like to thank all of you guys for, for being out here. This is uh, an incredible turnout, uh, especially my mom, uh, flying all the way from Texas to come see me. Uh, and my... <laughs> My old friend Patrick uh, from middle school actually is also here, but he, he lives here. He's already, already here. Um, all right, so the very first thing that I want to say is that it's a fantastic time to be a roboticist. Suddenly everybody wants a piece of what we're doing, and most of you guys know this. That's why you're here probably watching a robotics talk. But uh, robotic vacuum cleaners and animatronic dogs might have been the first exposure for some people um, to robots in their daily lives, but today everybody wants a selfie drone to capture their adventures or you know, a self-driving car to liberate them from their boring commute. Uh, and really, this is, this is awesome. This is happening today. These things are getting launched today. And robots are poised to be pervasive throughout society. And so the question is, are the roboticists ready? Like, am I ready for this? And, and more importantly than that, are the robots ready? Are the robots ready to think for themselves, out by themselves, out in the real world? And uh, it's kind of a, a big leap, actually, from where robotics has started. Uh, originally, Robotics uh, have been applied on the factory floor. Here you can see a bunch of manufacturing, arm, manufacturing arms welding together, for example, at a car chassis. And this planning problem, like this is, this is how the robot is actually thinking for itself, deciding what to do, is, uh, can be thought of as pretty abstract. It's more or less just a collision avoidance problem. Uh, you need to move around while not intersecting, uh, for example, other robots or the chassis or something like that. And if we want to actually get this, these cars, self-driving cars, out onto the real road as opposed to just being you know, confined into uh, a factory floor, the planning problem actually gets a lot more complex. And what do I mean by that? Uh, what is the difference really between the manipulator on top and, and the cars, self-driving cars, on the bottom? Uh, so I'll say that for a manufacturing arm, it knows that every time the assembly line advances, uh, a chassis will appear right in front of it that needs welding here, here, and here. And it knows that if it moves exactly here, here, and here, it'll be able to get the, to those welds exactly right on time and with millimeter precision. And this is actually big business. This is like a huge problem. Uh, I spoke to a, a manufacturing manager at Magna, who's the largest auto parts manufacturer that you may ne have never heard of, but they're, they're an enormous company. Um, <laughs> and they make all the parts for like your Honda cars or something like that. Um, and so this guy manages a team of 20 engineers trying to get these cycle times, uh, meaning when the, the assembly line can move forward, down from 27 seconds to 26 seconds, because that actually you know, represents like a 3% increase in productivity. And while that's big business and while that's you know, this whole team's job, where money really is lost is when somebody wanders onto the line. And this is a form of uncertainty that really isn't factored into the planning process, where that, that's why actually you see all these fences up here um, by the robot arms is you're, you're on the factory floor, you can try to control for uncertainty as much as possible. Uh, you, you let your millimeter precision, your robotic arms go to exactly where they need to go, and you do your absolute best in a completely controlled environment to make sure that everything is exactly like that simulation there in the top right. Now, the problem with getting robots out into the real world is that the question of like, somebody wandering into the robot's way, that's, in, in some sense, that's actually kind of the point. Like if you want a, a home robot helper uh, to make you dishes or sorry, to make you food or to help clean your dishes or something like that. Like it's, it's going to be daily, every day, interacting with a human, getting up in their face. And there's going to be this, this fundamental uncertainty that you can't necessarily control for. And so how are we going to deal with this uncertainty? What is, what is the, the strategy for you know, moving from uh, a completely clean world into a, a completely unpredictable uh, scattered world? 
And before I get into any of the details of, of my approach to this, I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of terminology. Uh, so this is a rough look at what the autonomy stack for a mobile robot look like, looks like today. Uh, this is presented differently in a lot of different places. I know my AA274 students probably learned this as the see, think, act cycle, which is, a, I think, a, a good um, you know, sequence of words. Uh, where essentially perception is a, a more <laughs> technical version <laughs> of the C step, uh, where in perception we have a robot you know, using its sensors, using its LIDAR or camera or radar or something like that, as a picture of the world, what the world looks like right now. And more importantly than that, it has a picture of where it exists inside its world. And so perception will tell you, you know, what has happened in the past and where you are right this second. And so for example, up here we have like a map. Uh, that is an example of perception. Uh, that a, a robot will be using, where you know its, it's localization is putting itself right there in the middle of, of the map. Um, so the next thing in the pipeline for a mobile robot today is is something called dynamics, where. I will say that dynamics is the ability to predict the future. And really, this is essential for planning. If you, like, for example, if you want to plan, if you want to do something, if you want to go somewhere, uh, you, you imagine in your mind's eye a future where you're going to take some actions. You're going to get in your car. You're going to drive across the city. You're going to get to where you want to go. Uh, and this imagination, I think, of the future is, is sort of a, a generalization of what I want to call dynamics. And so there's two major forms of dynamics. Uh, I would say that for a robot, a robot needs to think about how it will move. Uh, so for example, here in the top left uh, underneath um, this dynamics block, we have a, you know, a mathematical model of how cars move. Uh, and so this will say that if I push on the accelerator or push on the brakes or I turn the steering wheel, I know what will happen with my car. I know where it will be in the next you know, time step or, or a couple seconds to come. Uh, but really, the tricky thing, and, and so this is how you know, the, the manufacturing arms know how to, to adjust their motor torque so that they get to exactly the right place to make exactly the right weld. The tricky part, though, of dynamics, especially when it comes to uncertainty, is, is in, the, in the environment. It's what you don't have control over. But if you want to make a plan, you still need to be able to predict how the environment will evolve. And for uh, a, a robot uh, manufacturing a car, you know, th there is very little environmental uncertainty. On the factory floor, this is exactly what you're trying to control for. Uh, if you have a very good idea of you know, how your assembly line will move, um, then your car will stop exactly you know, millimeters away from where it's supposed to be, and then maybe your perception will tell you how to make up the difference. But th this future is sort of well understood. But here, for example, if we have two cars, uh, and this is an example that I'll be coming back to in this talk, uh, trying to you know, merge uh, lanes where one is trying to, the white car is trying to get to the left and the blue car is trying to get to the right, there's some sort of fundamental uncertainty here uh, where if I'm the robot car in white, of what the blue car will do. I don't know whether it's going to let me pass, um, which is the example on the right, or whether it itself will want to be taking the lead in this uh, traffic weaving scenario. And so if dynamics is how we predict the future, planning is, is how we're actually you know, turning this future prediction into robot actions. And so motion planning, uh, and here this is a picture of a, a quad rotor style robot you know, planning an aggressive path through a maze. It's basically if you have a start position and you want to get to an end position, or more generally speaking, um, you know where you are, again, from your perception, and you want to get to some goal or achieve some goal, um, in the case of task planning, uh, then you actually want to you know, steer your, you have to plan a sequence of actions subject to your model your dynamics model to actually achieve this. And then when it comes to carrying that out, uh, this is the, the role of the controller, where it takes sort of a plan that exists uh, in a very abstract sense, usually, and actually says, if I implement this and, and you know, keep it in the loop with perception, because basically this thing is actually a cycle where you take some small action and then you go back and see where you ended up uh, using your perception, your control will actually try to keep you close to your plan. And so this is the hierarchy that I'm talking about when I talk about uh, mobile robot autonomy today. And so really, critically, again, I want to I stress that the dynamics here is, is linked. The robot dynamics and the environment dynamics uh, can't really be disconnected. And if we have a lot of uncertainty in the environment dynamics, then we need to figure out you know, new tools for dealing with this. Uh, and so that essentially, um, quantifying the uncertainty in uh, robot planning and decision making, is, I would say, the research goal, mission statement, like an, an overarching goal of my PhD, where as a mathematician, when I say I want to quantify uncertainty, I want to actually put hard numbers that help me make decisions. Like for a human, I might just say like, oh, I have a vague feeling that doing you know, this action is better than some other action. But 
if I'm a robot and I have you know algorithms in, in computer science essentially you know running in my brain, I'd like to have a, a, a number associated with any potential action plan that I can take. And again, this is subject to all four of those things that I discussed before. I want to have some good idea of you know what actions are better than other actions. And I think I've made uh, sort of three main contributions, or had three main components of my PhD, uh, the first two of which I'll summarize here, and then the third one I'll, will be the, the majority of this talk. Um, so I think my, my first foray into robotics was quantifying the uncertainty and planning algorithm performance. Now concretely what that was is I was uh, establishing convergence rates for randomized planning algorithms. And this is really important because you know, if you make better and better algorithmic choices, you can ensure that your, your uh, planners will run faster and faster. And this helps you, again, sort of deal with uncertainty. Replanning is the most you know, rudimentary form of dealing with uncertainty. If, if something that you predicted didn't quite happen, then you can just plan again and deal with that. And so understanding the convergence rates of these algorithms, you know, how long it takes for them to get to a good solution uh, was a really critical aspect of, of uh, my first phase of quantifying uncertainty in, in robot motion planning. Uh, and I think my key takeaway there was is having that a, a deep understanding of your dynamics is key to implementing efficient planning algorithms. And that's how I got the, diverg how, that's how I got the convergence rate guarantees, is I really thought deeply about um, you know, the details of, of how dynamics interact with the planner. Um, the second main phase of my PhD was actually quantifying uncertainty in trajectory plan safety. So let's say that you actually have planned a path, and you, you say, like, if I have a robot that's going to try to track this path, try to implement it out in the real world subject to noise, for example, I have a plane trying to fly through a forest, and there's a little bit of wind that you know, is something that I couldn't quite predict, um, I want to know how safe that will actually be. And I think my, my main takeaway from this aspect of, of my PhD was that multimodality is really key uh, for you know, making good decisions. And what I mean by multimodality being a critical factor is usually when we think about a robot planning or a robot you know, trying to keep close to a planned path, uh, it has an idea of what sort of the average is. It has a nominal path or you know, the path that it planned, and its controller tries to keep itself close to that. And so if you think about all the different ways that the robot will go, it'll sort of just look like a big fuzzy tube of trajectories around the plan. But when it comes to quantifying something like safety, which is you know, how often you crash, you're really concerned about like the edges, the, the sort of not the middle, because if you're you know, driving directly down the middle, presumably your planner is, has done something safe. But you're really interested in, in the many different ways, the multiple modes of, of ways in which that you can crash. And uh, quantifying the relative likelihoods was sort of the, the mathematical details of that. But I think that you know, already here, this is, uh, this is something that I'm going to touch back upon in, in the rest of this talk. Um, the idea that these these multimodal these multimodal events these multi uh, these, these things that are uh, far away from the average so to speak are really what's interesting when it comes to making decisions, and so uh, I'm immensely proud of this work and I think it represents uh, a, a sort of large uh, I, I think it represents uh, an attack sort of treating the full stack of ro mobile robot autonomy especially in the second case where we really were considering all of planning dynamics control and perception. But the sorts of problems that these, quantif these quantifying uncertainty approaches can solve uh, are really re restricted, in my opinion, to cases where you can deal with the uncertainty at the planning phase. Um, where if you sort of have a model of your dynamics or your control or your perception, then these are examples, for example, flying a plane through a forest, where if you're just really smart about your planning, you can plan safe paths and say, I'm certifying that this is safe uh, according to my you know, mathematical algorithms. But again, when it comes to, to more complicated problems, and I'll show you one right now, this is a traffic weaving problem, uh, you're going to have to make some contributions in other areas, I think, of the, the stack. You can't just say, I have a, a smarter planner, where in this case, um, which is, this is right on the US 101, right by the in and out actually, if you guys have ever driven this. It's a familiar site, maybe, to some. Uh, you have a very short distance, actually, if you're trying to get off the or get onto the highway or off the highway on this on-ramp, off-ramp, to switch places with another car that might be you know coming right in, coming in hot right next to you, going exactly the same speed as you, and. It's not like a better planner will necessarily help you with this. You, you actually need some deeper understanding, some, some modeling uh, that will help you understand what the person next to you might do. Um, and so here, really the key is that you're interacting with a sentient agent. And here, this is, this is going back to my dynamics that I stress so much. The environment here is not just like some wind that you can say, oh, the, the average wind speed is you know, five meters per second in some arbitrary direction. Uh, you're interacting with someone smart, and you can't just you know, mathematically model that. Yeah, I saw some shaking of hands there. Um, 
Now, you're, you're interacting with the sentient agents. You need to model for how they might act. And really, there's, a, there's sort of a very tight deadline here, too, where actually it's 75 meters, um, which is about you know, maybe five seconds uh, to get on and off this off-ramp where uh, there's, there's some really critical deadlines, too. So you, ha you have to be making good decisions. You don't want to just slam on the brakes, because that could be one solution, or you know, jam the accelerator. That is a way to get past somebody else. But if you have a better model, this will allow you to make better decisions and make smoother plans. Um, and so that, uh, to convince you that this is actually sort of a difficult problem, um, this is a, an example of a Waymo car uh, trying to do exactly this. Waymo is one of the leaders, uh, if you haven't heard of them, in autonomous driving these days. And I, I don't mean to make fun of them. Like they are, they really are, you know, state of the art. Um, you can see that they have their turn signal on. The cars next to them also have their turn signals on. Everybody knows what needs to happen. So it's not a question of like we don't know, we don't know what it wants to do. It, it just can't negotiate this interaction with you know sentient cars next to it. And I really, I really do feel bad. Uh, this is going to be the video that shows up in every dissertation defense for the next you know three years. <laughs> just like Uptown Funk is played at every wedding reception is the instant it came out, I knew it would. And so I, I seeing this video. This is just past this April, so I'm, I'm not like playing some ancient video. Like this really is you know a, a pressing problem today. Um, how, do you, how do you know for sure? I bet they really wanted to get up at Warner Road, number one. And they're just messing with you to build their model of what you do. That's what I think. They have reached out. <laughs> um, okay. But uh, I'm just saying that's a possibility. It is a possibility. It's yeah. Explanation. No, it, it is. It is. It is possible that they're not messing with me. It's possible that they're just data gathering. They're saying, "What do people do when they see a turn signal on?" When you, but, when you put on your left team turn signal and then get off at Warner Road. Yeah. That's. That's do Google is all about organizing the world's I information? Would experiments. I would do that experiment. <laughs> you? Okay, I, I should give them more credit. They are they are they are fantastic software engineers. Uh, certainly, the car did what they meant it to do um, at the time. And uh, this is this is just to say that fantastic software engineering isn't quite enough to solve this problem. We need to actually you know new new theory, new research to do it, and, and that's what, why I'm here to tell you about this today. Um, so the third main pillar of my research, and that's all I'm going to talk about today, is, is quantifying uncertainty in interactions with intelligent agents. And so the first question is, how can we devise interaction models that are actually amenable to real-time planning? Because again, you have five seconds to do this. And you want to be replanning quickly because you're not sure what the person next to you is really doing. Uh, and so the first aspect of my work that I'm going to talk about today is learning probabilistic models of human behavior conditioned on interaction history as well as candidate future robot actions. And really, the conditioning on candidate future robot actions is the key aspect of, of this work, I think. That makes it no longer just sort of an analysis problem, but you're learning dynamics, where dynamics are, you know, if your robot does something, this is what will occur. Um, quantifying that uncertainty is, is really the key for planning. And then also, uh, notice that I have probabilistic highlighted in, in that sentence. Um, the next question is, you know, what can we do to ensure safety when we make poor predictions? Like, if we're wrong, is our, is our robot just going to plow you know, blindly ahead um, and crash into somebody, you know, not knowing that its predictions might be wrong? And so our approach for this is actually to augment the low-level tracking controller, the, the sort of last element of the robotic uh, autonomy stack with deterministic reachability-based safe, reachability safety constraints. And what that means is that safety is, is not something that's up to chance. It's not something that's up to you know, some probabilistic model where we might just get really unlucky uh, with our modeling. We're actually saying you know, hard, like a hard, concrete guarantees um, that we're definitely not going to crash no matter what, even if our model is you know, spitting out trash. Uh, so let's jump right into part one, uh, model-based planning for human-robot interaction. And so for this traffic weaving example, but I, I think there's many examples of, again, home robots where this, this is sort of critical, uh, you actually want to capture interaction dynamics. And what I've shown here on the right is actually a plot from BOSS, uh, the CMU team that won the DARPA Urban Challenge back in 2008. And this is the paper that they published, where they did their planning essentially using cost maps. Um, you can see in the top left there, this is a map um, maybe difficult to see of all the obstacles, uh, static obstacles in their world that they could see. Uh, they also, in the top right, could see other cars on the road. And what they did was they combined these two things into a cost map saying, I want to avoid white areas. I definitely want to avoid all the static obstacles, and I want to avoid sort of a fuzzy region projected in front of where this other vehicle will be. And don't get me wrong, like cost maps are a very good way to do things. Like you can take your cost map you know, pass it off to your planner, and your planner will just plan a trajectory through your cost map that's optimal in some lowest cost sense. Uh, and this is honestly how 99.9% .9 of, of uh, autonomous driving is done. Um, 
But again, this doesn't actually capture the interaction dynamics. This last 0.1% of, of tricky situations um, where the cost map has no, no element of prediction of the future, no dynamics, so to speak. Uh, another thing that I really want from my planning model is that it captures continuous actions and responses uh, on, on a very you know, split-second time scale. And so one approach that's also been used to sort of modeling driver behavior, uh, again, for the purposes of planning and, and uh, prediction, is uh, to say that you know, people are generally governed by a high-level intent. Um, for example, here on the right is a picture of, of a paper that considered a four-way intersection where people generally will be either trying to turn right, turn left, go straight. Um, they're going to be staying in the middle of the lane, or they're going to be, you know, trying to trying to go somewhere in particular. And I think for a four-way stop, this is I don't want to say a, a less interesting scenario to solve, but I think it's a less uh, real-time scenario to solve because, in a sense, it's just a couple bits of information. Um, like once you've decided who's going to go first at this four-way stop, then the problem is essentially solved. Whereas in this lane weaving or in this traffic weaving example, where you have two cars trying to pass each other, they're continuously jockeying for position, sort of nudging into each other. Um, in a, in a more real-time scale than a quote-unquote macro action could, could get you. And again, I want to point out that, uh, for, especially for traffic weaving, um, usually both cars have their turn signals on, so you know exactly which sort of macro behavior they want to achieve. And it really is really the details of the uncertainty and the dynamics that you want to, to understand in order to do your planning. Uh, next thing I want my planning model to capture is a, really a, a good idea of interaction histories. There's been tons of research, uh, and this is Katie Driggs Campbell, who's a postdoc here at, at Stanford, and her master's thesis showed that uh, you know, whether you're, you're actually paying attention or you're distracted by your cell phone um, really affects how you drive. And this is something that you can tell from, from like data. Like if you're interacting with somebody, you can sort of do a, a brake check. Um, or if you tap on the brakes, you can see if the person next to you or behind you is, is paying attention to what you're doing. And not only that, from interaction history, you should be able to infer things like aggressiveness or passiveness. Uh, so one of the guys that worked with this paper on me, um, our visiting scholar Wolf from, from Switzerland, I don't want to say anything about the Swiss, but like this guy was super aggressive. He just refuses to lose in simulations when we're, when we're driving, trying to, trying to pass each other. Uh, he was going to pass you every time. And this is something you can tell from like the first two seconds of the interaction. Like He's just slamming on the gas. And so we want to incorporate this into our model. We don't want to be uh, you know, sort of only forward looking. We want to you know, learn from our past as well. And uh, the last thing that I want to really stress is this idea of multimodality that I touched on earlier, where this right here is a plot of when the cars actually pass, when they sort of uh, are the same place in the lane, laterally speaking, how far away are they um, longitudinally along the lane? And so on the left here, uh, you can see that the white car is passing in front of the blue car. And I'm going to call that sort of a negative crossing distance, where uh, the distance that I'm plotting here is, is you know, this distance right here. And uh, on the other side, when you have sort of the other mode of the interaction, where the blue car passes, uh, the safety margin is exactly the opposite. And you'll notice that there is no average. Like the average case of this traffic weaving interaction does not exist, because the average case would be like you guys are intersecting, you guys are are crashed, uh, which is not great. Um, so you really want an interaction model that, that's able to, uh, to understand these, these two different modes. And again, like you can sort of enforce one mode by slamming on the brakes or, or jamming on the gas every time you go. But I think having a more intricate understanding of, of which mode is more likely in, in any given scenario will really help you do efficient planning. Um, and so the elephant in the room that I'm trying to sidestep for now, but I'll, I'll address briefly right now, is, is why am I even doing model-based planning at all? Uh, I could just try to come up with a mathematical, mo mathematical model that goes directly from uh, perception to, to action, or directly from, uh, directly from perception to an action policy. Uh, and the reason that I like model-based planning, which is sort of the antithesis of this, is that uh, Model-based planning gives you an explanation. Like fundamentally, I think that's the one thing that that can't be discussed. Like there's people that will argue that uh, in terms of generalizability or, or you know data efficiency, um, learning a model may or may not be worth it. But when I have a model-based planner, I can say that the robot did this. Again, the robot chose this plan of action because it thought that the future would evolve in this particular way. The robot does this because it thinks that the human will do this. Uh, and so that's why I'm sticking with this, this line of research for now, um, where I think that you know, really being able to justify your actions is, is key for safety-critical situations like self-driving cars. Um, 
So, and this is, this is also like coming in at a, at a very fundamental level. This is not some sort of post analysis. Uh, I'm able to, if I see something I don't like, then I'm actually able to change the way my, I'm doing my planning, uh, or I'm able to change the way that I'm doing my modeling um, to, to better you know, fit these explanations, or rather to make these explanations better in the future. So, uh, I'm gonna give you the most brute force way to model this. Um, which is, uh, if you assume that you know, you've, in the traffic weaving example, um, you guys are both driving cars, uh, or for example, for home robots, uh, you know that the robot you know, is built in some particular way and has some dynamics that governs just itself. Um, we're gonna say that, that a human moves some way and a robot moves some way, and we're gonna consider their, their joint state and joint control together um, as so. And we're gonna say that the human action choice is not necessarily random, but it's drawn from some distribution. Um, their next action, it's drawn from a distribution that's conditioned on both the interaction history and the robot's next action. This is the, the sort of most general way, I think, um, well, maybe not general, because uh, this is a discre discrete time formulation, but it is uh, the most brute force way that you can write this. You're saying this is just conditioning on all possible things, um, history and robot next action. And the reason why I'm doing this is not because I'm, I'm trying to say that the human knows what the robot's gonna do next. In fact, if these two things are actually you know, probabilistically independent, then this will show in this distribution. Um, but this is just the, the formal way that you can write down sort of a very general probability distribution for what the human might do next. Uh, and so to, to make this more concrete in the idea of the, the uh, mobile robot autonomy hierarchy that I mentioned earlier, uh, what we're saying is that we're trying to learn this, this stochastic human action choice. We're trying to, to fit a distribution for this, um, where in this case, uh, for the purposes of discussion here, I'm gonna say that the environment is the human. We have just the robot um, driving in its lane, and we have the, the human in the other lane, and they're both trying to, to pass each other. So I think there's uh, been a lot of thought on you know, how do humans actually drive. Um, you know, decades of work actually along these lines. And I think there's two main schools of thought, uh, the first of which I'll mention now, um, which is ontological approaches, which is saying that humans make decisions uh, due to some theory of mind. You're trying to you know, give some reasoning to their actions. Um, so for example, inverse reinforcement learning is saying that humans are making decisions according to uh, some optimal cost function or optimal reward function, where you know that if your robot is doing some sort of optimal planning, uh, then your human might be doing some optimal planning as well. Again, subject to some cost function that you might try to learn or try to fit from data. Um, so uh, assuming that somebody's like optimizing exactly is, is a very strong assumption because usually uh, the optimum for generally functions is, is unique or, or close to unique. It's maybe measure zero um, in, some, in some broad sense. Uh, so a lot of people fuzz this out saying that humans are approximately optimal planners and this is maximum entropy, inverse reinforcement learning, saying that the probability that somebody chooses some action is proportional to uh, the exponential of their cost. Uh, exponential of the reward or exponential of their <laughs> negative cost. Um, and I think this is, this is really you know, promising work for interpreting why humans do the things that they do, because you can sort of set up a cost function as a linear combination of very interpretable features. Um, but the issue, and to then gain insight from the weights that you fit, uh, I think that the reason why I don't take this approach necessarily in my work is that uh, there's no dynamics really here. Um, if you want to in inject like the idea of if a robot takes some action, this, is, this will have some effect on the future, um, then you need to make some assumption that like, oh, maybe the human will see the robot do this first. Um, and this is called a Stackelberg assumption where you assume that maybe the robot acts in some, you know, over some short time scale and then the human sees that and then does a reaction. And there's some sort of cascading action reaction. But really, th these two things can be happening simultaneously. Um, and also, uh, typically how IRL's uh, inverse reinforcement learning is applied is uh, in a Markovian sense, um, where, again, if you want this to be interpretable, you have some, some known features that you're trying to come up with some linear combination of these features to, to give you your reward or cost function. And uh, typically speaking, again, for interpretability's sake, this is not applied to historical features. This is applied to just you know, where I am right now. Uh, another way to sort of develop a theory of mind for a human-driven vehicle is to say that, uh, take this, this, this uh, action-reaction uh, directly into the model, where you're saying uh, you have some belief over what the other person might do. And so the human is maintaining a belief that the robot has a belief, that the human has a belief, that the robot has a belief. And this sort of cascading hierarchy of beliefs um, 
you can apply, uh, again, it, using the sort of theory of mind and, and compute you know, what you think is going to happen next. And uh, I think this is, this is really great for, for sort of problems with limited numbers of outcomes, because then uh, if, you, if you two are trying to decide something together, for example, uh, in the case of uh, Stefano Nicolaitis' paper, um, it was uh, how a robot and a human are moving a, a, a table outside of a room. Uh, the, the answer is, you know, I can either turn the table left or I can turn the table right, and the human and robot were just trying to get on the same page. But my worry with these hierarchical belief models is that as you sort of scale to more and more complicated problems or problems with continuous action, like this, this traffic weaving scenario, um, you might not be able to actually you know, propagate your, your beliefs uh, through you know, many, many layers of, of reasoning. And actually, more than that, I think my, my primary uh, concern with ontological approaches is that I don't really know that humans are guided by, by some you know, universal theory of mind. When I have the intelligent counterparty next to me, for example, here I have a, a robot uh, in white on the right and a human on the left, I don't think I can say you know, for certain whether the human is, is being cooperative in this case or adversarial or likely they're indifferent. Like They don't want to crash into me, so in that sense our objectives I think are aligned. Uh, but there's no really saying you know, what the human is thinking at any, any given point. Like Humans, I think, generally speaking, you guys would agree, are, are a bit inscrutable. Like You never quite know what, what somebody's thinking, like my committee right now. <laughs> um, Yes, and so the actions <laughs> that I'm taking, I'm giving the stock. Uh, no, so for example, if, if you think about a robot, uh, it, it has to know that you know, depending on what action it takes, it's not sure. What, and this is depending on you know, you can you can give it some terms like the the human is aggressive or passive or, or attentive or non attentive. Really, all that matters is the distribution of, of what comes out is what the human actually ends up doing because that's what you will actually use for your planning. Um, and giving it names is comforting and actually very interesting, I think, from a psychological perspective. From, but from a robot planning perspective, it's actually not essential to, to give motivation to people's actions. Um, so what I, what I want to say is that interaction here is actually a conversation. Um, this is the motivation for our, our data-driven approach, where uh, if you think of the robot query on the right here, this, this white line is being you know, a, a query and the human trajectory is being drawn from a, a set of responses, this actually feels a lot like natural language processing, um, where they have really, really complicated problems in, in language, where you know, if I ask Google a question, it might, like, especially if I ask my phone a question, it has to understand you know, what I'm saying, what question I'm asking, uh, and turn this very complicated you know, piece of, of data, linguistic data, into an answer, or a distribution over answers. And I think you know, the natural language people have come up with great data-driven models for that. And that's what I'm trying to emulate in my work. Uh, and I'll call these phenomenological approaches, which is saying, I don't care how the human's making its decisions, it's just doing them somehow, and I want to learn some distribution over them. Um, I would say that existing phenomenological approaches, uh, for example, I mentioned the, the macro action approach before, where you say that somebody is, is generating their actions, their low-level actions, through some high-level idea of their policy. They want to you know, turn left or, or go straight or something like that. Um, and I already mentioned my, my issues with that. There's also a deep neural network-based data-driven approaches, uh, mostly pioneered, I think, actually by Michael's lab. Maybe not pioneered, but you know, popularized by, by Michael's lab. Um, <laughs> more pioneered, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> Is this an attempt to reduce the uncertainty? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, again, here, uh, again here we're learning, typically speaking, policies uh, for human action that don't necessarily include this idea of a robot action. So again, from the robot's perspective, there's no notion of dynamics. And this is really good for analysis. This is really good for propagating like, a whole scene of cars together to see what they might do. And this is also really good for, for directly learning a policy for yourself if you're going to try to imitate, for example, a human policy. But what I really want is to learn dynamics where the robot is really the robot dynamics are really you know interlinked with the human dynamics, uh, so that you know this can be used directly to inform planning. And so, uh, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about right now is uh, how we we approached this problem was we collected a lot of data on the simulator on the left. Uh, we had two people sit uh, next to each other; they couldn't see each other's screens, and actually drove this scenario. And in the middle here, you can see you know a thousand traces from people doing this. Uh, we have the car on the left in, in orange, and the car on the right in blue, just all overlaid on each other. It looks like they're crashing, but they're not. I, I assure you that for any given pair of orange lines and blue lines, they're they're sort of doing a, a natural nice pass. Um, we yelled at them if they, they tried to crash into each other. Um, so we, we gathered a lot of data. We try to learn a model from that. We construct a, a robot policy. Um, 
and then we actually use human in the loop testing. And this is, again, something that I think is critical, where if I'm going to say that a human is a black box, essentially, I, I don't know why they're making the decisions that they're making, I can't trust that my learned model is necessarily correct. I have to, to bring humans back at the very end um, to sort of generate new data for me to test my policies on. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're doing here. We're replacing the human with, essentially, a, a black box in this dynamics model. And I think that this is actually just about as principled as you could possibly want. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stand on this and say that you know all, all a robot, uh, a self-driving car can say is I, I took this decision, I, I did this thing, because I thought the human next to me would do this other thing, and the people that say oh they did this because they're they're aggressive, they did this because they're passive, um, could be true, but I, I think that really you know fundamentally we're not losing anything in terms of uh, in terms of a principled approach by replacing the human with a black box here. Uh, so again, to bring back the math, uh, what we really want to learn is the, the, the next sequence of human actions, uh, this is on the left, uh, what I'm calling Y here, conditioned on both the interaction history, and so this is how you can get these elements, these things that you correlate with aggressiveness or passiveness, uh, but also critically on the robot's future. Um, and you can actually, uh, using sort of standard probability, break this down as a, as a product of individual draws over human actions. And uh, this sequential product um, actually reminds me a lot, or reminded me a lot, of a recurrent neural network. Um, and I think this is how you know, people typically think about uh, in language models also. Um, you're drawing sort of what, each word of a, a response, and here you're drawing each action, each little micro action, tenth of a second action from a human. Um, conditioned on actually previous human actions. And so remember these colors because they're going to appear on the next slide. Um, uh, well, so we also uh, ensure capacity for multimodality, which I mentioned was a, you know, an extremely important aspect of, of this scenario, um, through adding a latent variable, where if we're trying to learn the probability of y given x, we're actually going to say that it's going to be realized as a sum over z. Um, of uh, conditioning on an additional, you know, fake injected latent variable, and I don't think this is quite the same thing as injecting a notion of aggressiveness or passiveness or something like that that you've you've hand tuned. Um, if I'm allowing my model to sort of artificially uh, identify clusters of behaviors, this helps actually helps me improve my fit in terms of probabilistic uh, likelihood. But it also then does still add sort of a, a grounded form of interpretability in the sense that it's grounded actually in the data. Um, the other way that we achieve multimodality is, is through a Gaussian mixture model um, on the output, which is actually the, the purple stuff over there, where we express that as a, a mixture which, which says that if I'm, if I'm say, uh, uh, sticking with some, some particular z, where the z is you know, them trying to pass or something like that, the human is trying to pass, so there's many ways that they can achieve this, where uh, they might be accelerating for you know, half a second or accelerating for three quarters of a second. And within this behavior, there's actually many modes of how that can occur as well. Um, and so this all leads to the, the beautiful picture that you have in front of you here, um, where we are learning, we are fitting directly from data a generative model of human action distributions conditioned on the joint interaction history and the candidate autonomous driver future action sequence. And so right here on the left, we have uh, a recurrent neural network that summarizes, because it can be variable length, um, the history into uh, a single vector that says this is, this is kind of a belief state over what this history means. Um, same thing for the robot future, we're, we're summarizing that as well. And uh, the conditional variational autoencoder is just a way to actually train uh, the, the probability distribution that I, I sort of outlined above according to maximum likelihood. So it, it's a fancy name, but for those of you that are, are, have, have taken statistics but haven't really delved deeply into deep neural networks, you can just say that I'm trying to fit this mixture of Gaussian mixture models um, using uh, essentially just maximum likelihood. And, uh, in the decoder here on the right, uh, as I mentioned, um, we have Gaussian mixture models for drawing each individual human action, and that informs the next human action as well. Where if I know that somebody's accelerating for the first you know, three time steps, uh, then they will probably continue accelerating or, or you know, go to nothing. They won't, they're, they're unlikely to go directly from accelerating as hard as possible to instantly breaking as hard as possible unless you know, they think they've messed up. And so, uh, critically, I think this is, this is a computational aspect of this model, is that this model is very efficiently sampleable. Um, you can just sort of give it inputs of a uh, trajectory history, you know, from actually driving out on the car, you're, you're observing what you're doing, you're observing what the human next to you is doing. Um, 
and you have a, a candidate action in mind, you, for, for planning purposes, you think, oh, I might do this next. And you can just sort of feed that in the left and get answers right out the right. Um, and these things can be sampled in parallel. And this is, again, really great for, for planning, where uh, I, I don't have to be doing sort of any sort of iterative method. Uh, I can just draw you know, samples directly to help me estimate you know, the, the quality of a, a particular robot future action. And so let's see you know, how this actually works. I'm going to show you the, the fully trained version. This is a plot here of longitudinal acceleration, where uh, I like to think of cars as, as having sort of two main actions. You know, there's the steering wheel, and then there's the accelerator or the brake. Um, but really, most of the action, it turns out, in traffic weaving is, is this longitudinal jockeying for position. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, once the cars sort of disambiguate themselves longitudinally, then they can cross uh, freely. Um, and that's sort of a less interesting thing from a probabilistic modeling perspective. So here, uh, this is a plot of, of interaction history. On the left, um, I'm going to show you a couple of these where the, dot, the dashed blue line is, is what the robot is thinking about doing. And then all these little lines down here are samples from this future human action sequence. And these samples are going to be colored differently according to which uh, latent behavior mode uh, the neural network decided that they belong to. Um, so here, we can see that if the robot plans a hard acceleration, and that's the, the dashed blue line here, we're, we're thinking about you know, jamming on the gas for a little bit, um, we think that the human is likely to decelerate um, or possibly maintain speed. And that's saying it's likely that they're going to let me pass, although it's, it's by no means actually certain. Uh, for example, if you're driving against my, my buddy Wolf, um, he will be one of those, those small lines on the top. Um, and if we plan, a, if we plan to, 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 you know, push the brakes for a second or two, um, we actually think that it's likely, our, our model predicts that it's likely that the human will accelerate or maintain speed. Uh, and that's, you know, largely speaking, this, this uh, light blue mode um, that you see up here. You know, most of the samples are from that. And uh, if the robot plans to wait and see, and this is actually sort of the most interesting case, uh, if we wait and see, then it's likely, we predict, that the human will actually be the person to make the first move, where there's sort of two equal modes uh, of, in, in light blue and in, in an orange on the bottom, uh, the human uh, might either uh, decelerate, accelerate, or also they could also be waiting and seeing, and that's the, the big fat line in the middle um, as well. And so to convince you, uh, again, you know, more numerically that our, our model is actually good, um, I'm saying uh, if we take away these different aspects of multimodality that we tried to bake directly into the model, if we take away, for example, the latent variable, uh, or we take away the, the uh, Gaussian mixture model and the output, um, we see these different uh, sort of prediction responses um, in these three graphs here, where uh, if we get rid of the, the latent variable, then of course all of our, our predictions come from the same mode, the same green mode in the middle. And you lose interpretability, and it actually turns out you, you slightly lose a little bit on the evaluation metrics, where this negative log likelihood is something that we want to be as low as possible. This indicates our goodness of fit. Uh, and actually, if we get rid of the, the Gaussian mixture model on the decoder output, um, we really lose a lot in terms of uh, the evaluation metric. And that's because without this multimodal, uh, you know, low-level output, um, you lose the ability to have sharp predictions, where usually when people are driving, at least we found, um, you know, they're, they're putting their foot on the gas and then taking it off, or they're tapping the brakes. There is no sort of linear ramping. People, people aren't, well, robots. Um, you know, you know, uh, pushing on the, the gas super slowly or uh, pushing on the brakes super slowly. They're, they're just going sort of on or off. Uh, and you lose that ability with, uh, without the Gaussian mixture model on the decoder. And actually, if you get rid of both of these sources of multimodality, this is sort of a basic LSTM predictor, um, uh, then you actually just do absolutely horribly in terms of prediction. And uh, I guess that's not that surprising, because if you're predicting sort of one main prediction, half the time you're going to get it completely wrong. Um, okay, so that's, the, that's our, our plan for the model. When it comes to actually uh, constructing a policy, you know, what, what should the robot actually do? Again, we're, we're considering candidate future actions. We're considering a tree of possibilities for the things that we might try to do. Uh, and from our model, we're drawing likely responses that we think the human might, might apply. And we build an action tree that's actually dependent on, on the robot's current state. Um, and that's what we see here, uh, depending on whether I'm, my velocity is forward, uh, you know, slightly left in the lane, because this is a sideways lane, or slightly right in the lane. Um, this tree of actions looks a little bit different depending on where I am. Um, but basically, we have a, a tree of 4,000 different action tr 
possible actions. And uh, we apply hindsight optimization, which is you know, not the most state-of-the-art uh, form of planning under uncertainty. But I think it does a really good job of capturing proactive behavior, um, where the idea of hindsight optimization is you, you sample a bunch of scenarios. You, you sort of fix uh, possible responses and say, like, if I knew that this response was coming, um, then this, this is a, a good action to take. Where here we're sampling you know, 32 different scenarios, saying, on average, if I wait a little bit, the human will sort of show their cards. They're, they're going to show whether they want to go forward or backwards. And this allows us to achieve our lane change um, with minimal control effort expended, uh, because you know, they're doing the work to get past me or, or behind me. Um, and this is one of the things that's uh, in the robot's cost function when it's evaluating uh, these different scenarios. Uh, we have a collision avoidance penalty, a control effort penalty, uh, a lane change incentive, which is you know the robot does want to end up switching lanes. And we have a, something I call a disambiguation incentive, which is essentially a, an approximate look ahead, saying that the situation that I want to end up in is where uh, instead of you know the two cars being next to each other or the car behind being faster than the car in front so that these two cars will sort of pass each other and, and draw level. I actually want the car in front to be moving faster and the car behind to be moving slower. And if I get into one of those situations, then my, my robot is rewarded if it, it thinks that this might happen. Uh, so this is you know 100,000 samples, but we just the, again, the, the advantage of applying this particular both modeling scheme and decision-making scheme is that we can just paralyze the whole thing entirely and actually get replanning uh, every 0.3 seconds, um, which is decently fast, actually. Um, and we can see that in human-in-the-loop testing, and here uh, this is going to be showing the human is, is going to be, the, the videos that I'm going to show are going to be focused on the human in blue because, you know, a human actually sitting in front of a wheel with gas pedals in front of them. Uh, we're going to see that uh, here, this is sort of our predictions, our live predictions of longitudinal acceleration integrated into longitudinal velocity up there. Uh, and these are the, the actual positional predictions um, displayed on the, the side and bottom here. Um, you know, we can see that the robot actually decides here, like, oh, the human's not going to make a move, so I better go ahead. Um, here, the human, uh, you know, accelerates and the robot decides, oh, then I think I should probably slow down. And here, the robot actually proactively nudges in. Um, the brake lights weren't working in this particular simulation yet, uh, causing though the human to brake, um, and that actually you know causes a, a smooth negotiation of the scenario, which is which is awesome. Um, our model is actually being used to plan intelligent policies, uh, which would be great until disaster occurs. Um, <laughs> You know, wh wh why did this happen? Uh, so this happened rarely, but this is a case where you know our, our human car just drove directly into the robot car, or vice versa. It's not really clear who's at fault here. Um, but I will say that uh, reasons why this can occur is that replanning at three hertz every 0.3 seconds is is ultimately too slow to ensure safety. If somebody next to you sort of twitches over and, and starts to, to drive into you, 0.3 seconds later they're on you. Um, and so we're, we're going to need something faster than this. And also, incorporating collision avoidance as a penalty, because um, it was just one of four terms that I mentioned, uh, can actually cause conflicting objectives. Like, it's really not clear um, how to ensure that collision avoidance is, is really like the number one thing if you're just mushing everything together into one big linear combination of reward. Um, so that brings me to part two of my talk, is what happens when my prediction gets it wrong? Because here, clearly here, the robot did not think the human was going to crash into it, because um, that never occurs in, in, for example, the data set. And uh, what, what can we do at you know, the far right of our control stack on the control end to ensure that crashes never occur? And so this, again, is a problem that's been studied a lot in the literature um, of how we can, how we can prevent uh, you know, autonomous vehicle collisions, um, where I think sort of the, the, mas the most basic possible thing is, again, to use cost maps, co these cost maps that I mentioned before, where you just say, this is a region where I don't want to go. Uh, for example, here, I, I don't want to go right behind another car because they might break and then they're, they're going to cause a, a crash. Um, so I'm going to plan a path that sort of avoids these, these unsafe regions. But again, here, there's no notion of interaction, or sorry, no notion of, uh, of coupled dynamics, um, where it's not clear that uh, anything that you're doing is necessarily getting incorporated into, uh, into the safety assurance. So something uh, that's really been inspirational for our work, actually, is uh, the, a paper by, uh, by Matt and co. Uh, with the DDL, um, which is including collision avoidance as actually a controller constraint. And so this is, I, I think, a much more uh, dynamically aware uh, thing to do, 
than, uh, than to just draw potential fields and try to draw like a, a path that avoids them. Where actually here, if you're replanning, uh, in this case, 100 times a second, and saying, I'm only allowing myself to think of, of paths that lie in this collision-free tube, um, here uh, avoiding these, these obstacles, then we can sort of have a, a strong guarantee that we're never going to actually hit these things. Um, and so th this is really great, but this works so far only exists for static obstacles. Um, you're planning controls where you're avoiding, um, where you're, you're saying that my, con my controller will exist within this tube uh, defined by static obstacles. <coughs> and so uh, the, the, the next thing that I think that has really inspired our work is, is the idea of reachability. Uh, where reachability, I, I like to think of as sort of a dynamics-aware potential field or a dynamics-aware cost map, where if you're really thinking about um, uh, you know, what system you've got going on, uh, for example, here on the left we have a, a, a paper from Mo Chen, our postdoc, um, saying that if you know that you're, you're driving a bicycle, then you know exactly which states you don't want to get into um, because these are states that could lead to possible collisions. And I'll discuss that more in just a second. Um, typically, these reachability-based based methods have been applied uh, in an online switching context where on the right here we have a, a quad rotor um, trying to learn how to fly an, an up and down uh, trajectory. Uh, and here we had a, a safety controller stepping in to save the quad every time it, it gets too low. Um, to ensure that, uh, and this is based on a, a notion of the quad rotor's dynamics. Um, so we have a reachability controller stepping in, taking, taking over from the learning-based controller in order to ensure safety. Um, but again, this is, this is not really uh, ideal in our case because, for example, here, uh, we're trying to track some sort of nominal trajectory. Um, in, in Matt's paper, uh, we're tracking a, a trajectory down the middle of the road and, and only avoiding obstacles as necessary, whereas switching to like a, a be safe at all cost controller is maybe a little bit um, excessive, as we'll see. Um, so to give you an idea of what reachability is, uh, reachability, I think, for most people when they think about uh, the term reachability, would be forward reachability, where you project the states of all possible places the human car can be. Um, in the future and just say, I want to avoid any of, these, any of these possible places. But it turns out that this gets way too conservative. Like the places that the human car can be, uh, even over a second or two, you know, grows into this huge cone because they could be turning right or left or whatever. Um, and if we're just going to try to avoid that, then this is, I think, a little bit too restrictive for you to actually get anything done. Um, it's, you know, quickly enough, the whole road will just be crossed out with a, with a keep out zone. Um, so we're, what we're doing in this work is we're applying backward reachability, um, which is a, a more closed loop notion of safety, where you're allowing for the possibility that in the future, depending on what actually occurs, you'll be able to take action to avoid collision. So here, um, the keep out zone is a much smaller region around the human car, uh, where I'm just imagining that if the human were to swerve, uh, I could swerve too. And really, this is a motivating idea for this work, um, where I think I've said before um, that if, if there's a car next to me and they decide to swerve into me, then I'm, I'm instantly toast. Well, that's not true. If there's, if there's an open field to the right of me and, they, and I have a computer sort of controlling my actions, the instant I see them swerve, I could swerve too and avoid them. And so this is, this is the idea of, of closed loop safety, where I'm just sort of keeping in my back pocket this, this potential for, for safety. And so this is something that most of us apply on the road. Uh, this is the idea of the, the, uh, the buffer zone when you're uh, driving on the highway, you want to say, for example, 60 feet behind another car. Um, it's not because you're trying to avoid anywhere that car could possibly be. If they do slam on the brakes, um, then you wouldn't be able to be anywhere on the road. Uh, but you're just keeping this idea um, in your back pocket that if they do slam on the brakes, you'll be able to see, that, th see this and react accordingly. Um, and so uh, this, this uh, react accordingly is a function of, of the dynamics. And here, I, I put this slide up just to scare you guys, um, where we're, we're modeling the robot using these extremely complicated dynamics. Um, this is not even the most complicated vehicle model that you can have. But this is the six-state bicycle model. And there's all sorts of like, craziness hidden in here. There's tire models. There's all sorts of friction considerations um, that, are, that are in uh, the robot dynamics. And this is what we actually need to, to drive these cars on the road. This is what we actually need to do to actually um, get a self-driving car out there. Uh, and we're modeling the human dynamics using a slightly more simplified model, um, not the bicycle model. I'll, I'll call it the dynamically extended simple car model, where essentially we're allowing the human, since we don't you know, quite know what they're doing, um, to accelerate arbitrarily you know, forward and backwards, and then also turn arbitrarily. Um, and so ultimately, this, this allows the, the human to be slightly more active than the robot. Um, they can sort of you know, reach 
maximum turning radius or minimum turning radius a little bit more quickly than the robot. But uh, I think this is this is a sort of minimally conservative assumption um, that we're applying here, and. What we do with reachability is we combine these two into relative dynamics, and oh my god, it's gotten even more complicated. But the key here is that these relative dynamics are something that we can reason about completely offline, meaning that we can just churn these through our supercomputer, or in the case of, of us, our, our desktops, you know, for a couple days in a row. <laughs> um, and after turning them through our supercomputer, uh, we actually arrive at um, we actually arrive at, at something that we can apply very quickly in an online fashion, and I'll, I'll describe that right now, where the idea of reachability is you're, you're keeping track of something called an avoid set, which is the set of relative states from which there exists no guaranteed safe robot policy preventing collision in the next t seconds. And so this already sounds, this, I mean, this sounds like the right answer, right? This is this, is this closed loop notion of, of reachability that I was discussing earlier. Um, but it turns out that the answer is very simple if t is zero. The set of, of states where you can't avoid collision in the next zero seconds is the states where you're already colliding. And this is why it's called backward reachability. You just work backwards from this using knowledge of your dynamics. I'm um, to say, you know, under optimal disturbances, under optimal somebody trying to crash into me, then there's still safe policies for me, safe paths for me to take um, to avoid collision in the future. And so this is the uh, HJI, Hamilton, Jacobi, Isaacs uh, partial differential equation is this, this backwards propagation. It's this dynamic programming operation that we're using to, uh, to actually describe this avoid set using a value function, uh, where the value function um, is sort of keeping track of how close I am, how safe I am um, with respect to uh, collision, or inevitable collision, as it were. And uh, assuming equal con equivalent control authority between the human and robot, even though they're not described by exactly the same dynamics, um, I want to have the idea that the human and the robot, if they accelerate as hard as possible or break as hard as possible, they ultimately have the same, um, the same possible controls that they can output, uh, then these will converge to sort of stable sets. Where the idea here is that if, if the, the human car is faster than the robot car, then eventually the human car would be able to run me down if I'm a robot planning. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of another assumption that we're making here is that we have equal authority so that there is at least some notion of, of inevitable safety. And so I've plotted a few of these value functions on the right, um, where here, if the robot and human are sort of pointed the same direction and going the same speed, then the uh, highlighted in, in dark black here is the avoid set, um, where it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit fatter in the back, uh, and this is because the human car can actually turn faster than the robot car, and the center of mass is behind uh, the middle. So if if a human car is next to you. The human car is, for example, right here, and the robot car is in the middle. Uh, then this is an unsafe place because the human can very quickly turn into you, and you won't be able to do anything. Um, and so uh, I think the middle one is, is also an interesting case where if the robot is moving very quickly, uh, the set of unsafe states, unsafe states, relative states, is actually different. Or again, here if we have the robot in the middle. Um, Having the human car be out here in front of it is an unsafe place because if the human slams on the brakes, again, they're moving slower than the robot, there's no way that we can slow down quickly enough to avoid collision. There's no way that we can slow down and swerve to avoid this. Um, and on the bottom here is if uh, we're actually not pointed necessarily the same direction, uh, then here we don't want the, the human to be anywhere sort of below uh, the robot car here. These are all unsafe uh, sets, in, uh, unsafe relative states in orange here. Um, and so here you can kind of see that it's, it's a dynamically aware notion of a potential function uh, where you're really understanding you know, what's going on in the dynamics, and this informs how uh, you're going to achieve your safety. And uh, yeah. What are you assuming about the human car here, what their, what, what their policy is? Are you assuming they're doing their worst? Oh, it's worst case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, here, we're, we're not making any sort of probabilistic assumptions. That, that exists in the high-level planner, because here we want to be able to guarantee safety. And I'll, I'll discuss, like, that's a bit of a, a strong desire, even. It's not necessarily a strong assumption, but it's, it's like a, a strong goal for us. But really, this is important where, for example, if we're out there uh, at the test track, Guaranteeing safety is, is something that we need to do because we only have one test vehicle. <laughs> um, and so then we can make us. A... <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other considerations as well. <laughs> <laughs> I want to point out that the safety is not one priority. Yeah, and, and, and human life. <laughs> um, and so I, here I've only plotted a, a couple of these sets, but really this is a very complicated thing. Our relative state is, is seven dimensional, actually. And, and so even though I've, I'm, I'm plotting just a couple slices of this, this is dynamically aware in a very, very complex complex uh, way that's boiled down all of this you know, super complicated dynamics, including tire frictions and all sorts of wild stuff, into essentially just stay out of this area. 
Um, so let's actually see what this looks like on the track. This is Thunder Hill, my, my home away from home a little bit over the past year. Um, where uh, we're actually trying to put this on, again, a research vehicle that I mentioned, uh, X1, where this is not uh, really a traffic weaving case, but if I try you know, you know, scrubbing in different directions, you can see the shape of the avoid set really changes over time. Uh, and so what this plot is here is uh, the green is sort of the start of the lane weaving interaction, traffic weaving interaction. The red is where I'd like to, to finish it by. It's sort of, you can think of it as the, the cutoff of the highway. You know, you're either getting to the, the in and out or you're not. Um, the, the line, the, the main green line here is the nominal trajectory, the trajectory that we want the red car, which is the robot car, to follow, um, which is color coded by speed. Um, so green here is, or sort of yellowish green is sort of average speed. Um, and the green car here is a, a human car, which is for right now controlled just by me um, on uh, either a, a handheld controller or a, a wheel and, and pedals. Um, because still I'm not you know, ready to put this out in, into the real world with two physical vehicles. Um, so again, like I was saying, typically the way that this is applied is as soon as you get into the avoid set, uh, the way that you're doing this, this dynamic programming, the way that you're propagating this PDE is you're computing optimal control actions this whole time. And so what you can do is as soon as you hit the avoid set, you say like, oh, a disturbance has occurred that is putting me in danger. Let me take the optimal action to avoid it. And so what does this look like? You know, as soon as we touch it, even slightly, um, I'll show that again. As soon as uh, the human car touches the edge of the avoid set, even slightly, the robot car slams on the brakes and you know, jerks the wheel to the right, which is sort of end of experiment. I mean, it's safe, but typically speaking, actually, we have other objectives. Remember, we have our, our whole mobile robot autonomy stack. Uh, it's not just a question of either I'm following my job or I'm being safe. Um, we have this whole idea of going from uh, a planner to control, where uh, we, I spent this you know, half an hour talking about you know, the really smart way to do planning with really probabilistic modeling and, and, and having smooth control. Uh, I don't want to throw that away. And so what we want is a, a fast yet minimally safety, a minimal safety intervention with respect to our, our smart planner. Um, and here, the minimal intervention is, is not just, I only want to apply it when I reach the edge of the avoid set. Is I want to actually, when I get to the avoid set, um, project the otherwise optimum control onto the safe set. So this is even, even uh, less interventional than saying, when I hit to the edge, I'm going to apply the optimal safety control. I'm going to apply just enough safety to keep me from crashing, or to keep me out of the avoid set, rather. Um, and so, generally speaking, this can be computationally intensive. This, this avoid set is non-convex. Uh, and so then saying, I want to have uh, my next control lie inside, uh, put me in my next step inside this avoid set is, is sort of a hard thing to do. Uh, but what we do is we linearize it. And we linearize uh, with respect to our current control um, the value function and say that as soon as we get, and to, to accommodate the, the inaccuracy of this linearization, we say as soon as our value function drops below epsilon, where epsilon is some positive number greater than zero, uh, zero being the potentially unsafe avoid set, um, we're going to want the, the gradient uh, with respect to our control to be positive. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we're going to want the, the gradient uh, dot the actual control that we actually take to be positive, meaning that the value function should be increasing. And so here's a, a plot of this, where we have a, the value function sort of complicated here on the left, clearly non-convex. Um, and what we're saying is we're turning this into a, just a linear constraint on our, our next control. Um, and this is what we're actually going to bake into the MPC controller. Um, and so this is, this is it in its full generality. Uh, I want to say that essentially none of this is, is, is new except for this inst instantaneous interaction safety constraint, um, where what we're doing is we're applying a form of uh, sequential quadratic programming. Uh, I'll call it lazy sequential quadratic programming because it's actually a minor miracle um, due to the work of Stephen Boyd and his, his, his collaborators um, to allow us to solve these, these quadratic programs 100 times a second. Um, so we're just augmenting this, this control problem over uh, the actions that we want to take over the next couple seconds. Um, we're augmenting this with this one constraint on our next action. Um, and so this is sort of a dynamically aware potential function um, that's keeping us, us safe here. Uh, and so to, to summarize our system architecture here, we are actually incorporating things from you know, all aspects of, of uh, the robot mobile 
the mobile robot autonomy stack in order to achieve our aims here. We're, we're addressing uncertainty in interaction dynamics in order to come up with you know, good, smooth trajectories. Uh, we're integrating in the control and uh, uh, dynamics where constraint um, to keep us safe. And uh, here, uh, again, if we, wanted to have, if we want to take, generally speaking, an, an unsafe path according to our, our value function, according to our avoid set, um, what our controller is going to do is it's not going to say swerve to the left as hard as possible, but just take you know, the thing that is minimally avoiding uh, entering the unsafe set. So how does this actually work? Um, here we can see uh, these first two cases are going to be uh, just completely nominal operation. The avoid set never actually touches uh, the human car, where, again, we have this buffer zone around the robot. Um, and you can see here, like, the, predic the predictions of the human car are generally um, pretty decent. That's what we have uh, splayed out in this uh, cone in front of the, the human car. Um, but here is a case. Ew. Uh, let me play that again. Here's a case where the human sort of instantly sort of gets onto the robot car, and you can see that the robot speeds up more than it otherwise would have done in order to avoid this. Um, here's a case where we very lightly touch, again, the side of the avoid set, um, but the, the car doesn't freak out like it did in, in the previous example of, of directly switching to the, the ultra safety controller. It just breaks as much as it needs to, to avoid possible unsafe situations. Um, and this last case is the extreme, where you can see uh, the human car just completely plows into the robot car. And yeah, okay, the, the robot car takes a very wide path, but it does actually achieve, ultimately, the goal. Uh, and so um, we have some preliminary results, putting this out onto the field, uh, you can see here. Um, this is me and Karen, actually, in X1 doing this. Um, where uh, if you check back on the Stanford ASL YouTube in a month, uh, ideally we'll have the, the nice, beautiful drone video of this. Um, but we are focused on actually getting this out into the, the real world, um, which is something that I'm going to be quite proud of when, when we're done. So uh, the conclusions that I want to leave you guys with is that uh, in terms of model-based planning for human-robot interaction, we can actually explicitly learn interaction dynamics. We're critically here, we're incorporating robot candidate actions into the dynamics, because this is how you actually do planning. Um, and I'd also like to say that neural networks for human action modeling, I think, are, are just as principled as any other possible method. You're encapsulating all the, the, the crazy uncertainty into sort of a black boxy function approximator. Um, but I don't think you're, that you're necessarily losing anything by doing that. Uh, in terms of the reachability constrained safe tracking controller, uh, I like the idea that safety can be imposed as a hard constraint um, while minimally impacting the performance of like this smart controller that you work so hard on. Uh, this minimal impact is, is really key where uh, you never, you never want to give up until you absolutely must. And so I, I think we showed that, that doing this projection of the optimal control onto the safe set is, is doing that. Uh, in terms of future research directions, obviously concrete next steps are uh, something that I didn't mention quantifying, is quantifying how well this ultimately does, because I think for that you need sort of a large user study. Again, I said the only way that you can test this is with humans in the loop. Um, and uh, that I think would require a, a decent amount of effort, but would p potentially gain uh, a lot of insight on, on how to design our, our models and controllers. Um, scaling to more agents is, is something that's important as well, and Boris has actually looked at that, where if I don't want to have just two cars interacting, or th but I want to have three or, or four or, or more cars interacting, then intelligently figuring out uh, interaction dynamics models for that is, again, essential to having a robot plan in those scenarios. Um, but uh, along those lines, I actually think that an open research question that's really interesting is, is what portion of the environment dynamic should actually be modeled as interactive? Again, like I was saying, 99.9% .9 of, of self-driving cars plan just using a cost map. And I, I think that this, to, to incorporate my work uh, most you know, instantaneously, if I wanted to, to get this on the road uh, tomorrow, I would say identify the cases where you think that you're doing a pairwise interaction with somebody. Because ultimately, that's, that's probably what it is. And I think Boris's work is, is also along these lines, identifying um, you know, what are the critical connections, what are, what are the critical sources of interaction uh, where you actually need to, to learn a very detailed dynamics model versus the other pieces where you can just say, oh, I want to forward propagate some prediction um, without you know, all this multimodality and, and reactivity. Um, and also uh, uh, something that's essential is, is how to, to use reachability in cases where safety cannot actually be guaranteed. Um, or I, I like to think that uh, out on the test track, uh, our, the world is our oyster. Um, we have you know, infinite tarmac to swerve into if we must. But I think that uh, a common criticism of this style of work is if you're just boxed in, if, if you have cars all around you or you have a, a barrier on your right, what are you going to do? Like, you're going to say that uh, there's just no possible 
completely guaranteed safe action, right? Um, but I think that reachability is, is still useful as, as a sort of coordinate system. Uh, the value function, the value function gradient, um, I think can be used as a, a way to, a, of thinking about in a sort of dumb way what is safe, where your, your smart way is like actually doing some, some deep probabilistic prediction of, of how humans might act. But uh, I think that the, the value function gives you, gives you some insight there as well um, that you could possibly still apply at this 100 hertz safety guaranteeing level. Um, and the last thing I, I, I'm actually interested in is, is how can we re redesign HRI systems completely from the bottom up to enable better performance, simpler algorithms? And this is motivated by uh, Osama Khatib here at Stanford, who often says that, uh, why are we working so hard on, on control? And he's talking about you know, grasping, uh, grasping objects with a, 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 a robot manipulator. Um, why are we working so hard on, on doing control for that when we can just make a compliant manipulator, meaning a soft hand, where your soft hand can just pick things up Easily, uh, and so I, I think this is actually an extremely relevant question. Like, how can we redesign our systems so that we don't have to do, go through all this effort of, of multimodal modeling? Um, and uh, you know, really, uh, really clever ideas. Where I, I think that you know, using these tools, using these frameworks that I developed, you're able to quantify the effects of this. Where if you change something about your dynamics or you change something about your your modeling um, and take different data associated with that, you can actually say, uh, this is how my my planning control will, will measurably change. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank, first of all, my committee. Um, thank you, Marco, for taking me on when uh, few, I think, would, would, would take a, a leap of faith on, on somebody like me coming back, having quit school um, once. And uh, <laughs> I, I, really, like, I, I really appreciate it uh, immensely, um, you giving me the chance to, to, I think, really do some amazing and, and high quality thesis-worthy work. Um, <laughs> but uh, the reason why I, I've been here so long is because I actually just don't want to leave. It's, it's been awesome. Like, this is, I want to be doing this for the rest of my life, is, is doing this sort of research. Um, thank you, Mac, uh, for just you know, uh, providing such quality students. <laughs> like, I, I know that we haven't interacted that much personally, but like Zijan and Mingyu, like, they are on the X1 team with me, and they, they really know what they're doing. Um, and they've been incredible help to me. Thank you, Michael, for oftentimes representing the antithesis of, of us, both on the Frisbee field and also theoretically. Um, <laughs> ways to approach problems, and I, I, I anticipate being grilled, and I, I would appreciate it, because uh, I, I want to be confident in the things that I'm saying. Go yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, uh, for, for providing uh, the experimental platform and just even teaching me about all these vehicle dynamics. I think that most roboticists, at least from the control side, think about the Dubin's car, which is a, a three-state car model, as being sort of the, the best car model that they'll ever have to plan for. Um, but really, uh, having an X1 in front of me really has, has caused me to think about the whole stack of autonomy from perception all the way down to control. Um, and how, how, to actually, how you actually need to change your algorithms with all four of those things in mind. Um, and thank you, Stephen. Uh, in particular for OSQP, it's like a demon. Like it, it is the quadratic program solver that I, I was mentioning before. Um, and of course, thank you for, for telling us that like, these incredibly complicated control problems c can actually be solved for real life applications. I'd like to, of course, thank all of my co-authors, um, particularly Karen for, for putting together the, the food in the back, but also because uh, I think I've squatted all of our work. She was, on, she was on both of these papers with me that I discussed today, uh, and now she'll have to find something else to talk about for her defense. <laughs> I, I actually feel really bad about that. And of course, Wolf, Mo, John Talbot, Boris, Joe, uh, Benoit, Ashley, Lucas, uh, ZJ, Sumit, sorry, I've got to say everybody's name, uh, Brian, and Javier. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the communities that I've been a part of. They say that a, a craftsman is only as good as his tools, but his tools are built by communities. So I will say that a researcher is only good as his communities. Um, there's, of course, the ASL uh, in official events where we are, are crushing other teams at sports, um, and also in more friendly context on the bottom. I'd like to thank my cohort at, at ICME. Um, I, I'd like to think that there's this idea where if you meet somebody before they become famous, like you, you have a, a deep insight onto who they really are as people. Um, and uh, I, I like to, to think that I met all four of, of these guys. Um, Yukai, Ernest, Reza, and Jason, and of course Margot, also for believing in me, much the same way that Marco did. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all four of these guys for, for teaching me a lot of stuff and for allowing me to follow their careers with great envy. Um, 
And I'd also like to thank the, the X1 community. Um, everybody that is working on it right now, and they're, they're pictured over here. Um, it's Talbot again, Matt Brown, uh, Alstrada, ZJ, uh, and Mingyu, or ZJen, sorry, and, and Mingyu. Um, and everybody that's ever worked on X1 in the past. Uh, because they built an incredible platform for us to do some work on. And I'd like to thank the Julia programming community as well. Uh, yeah. if, ever, anybody, if, if people take one thing away from this talk, I'd like them to cite uh, one programming paper. Um, and I'd also like to thank Larry and Godwin are also on the, the X1 team as well. Um, and then finally, I'd like to acknowledge my family, um, first and foremost, similarly for believing in, in me through this long slog. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wish my, uh, my father and sister could be here today. But yeah, they, uh, I think, are watching on the live stream. And uh, my dog, I'm sure, is paying attention as well. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to, of course, thank all of my friends, um, Patrick and Jeff, for showing up, even though uh, actually they, they're, they're probably pretty well versed in this, this style of work. Um, but I, I'd like to thank you guys for, for showing up personally as well. Uh, are there any open questions? I think I have run a bit over time. Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> you're training the variational autoencoder to like capture uncertainty. Does it capture the epistemic uncertainty, of, like having finite data and not capturing everything you could possibly see? No. Uh, I mean, th that that is a huge question. Like, uh, and it's a question even of, of like data cleaning. Um, I, I think I briefly mentioned that uh, we yelled at people if they they played the the simulator too much, like a video game. Um, but of course, like some of that crept in as well. Uh, I think our, our motivation in this work is that uh, people are instrumenting, like self-driving car companies are instrumenting, instrumenting uh, huge fleets of cars out there and gathering huge amounts of data. Um, and again, what I'm trying to do here with the high-level planner is achieve a good level of performance in the average case. And I think this is something that you can, you know, given sufficient data, you can actually claim to do pretty well. Um, where here the average case is uh, you know, going to be a, a smooth a smooth transition where somebody is kind of trying to pay attention to you and, and, and has their uh, interests aligned with yours. I mean, if you have somebody that's like actually being crazy, they could just track you exactly. Um, and we did. We also filtered this out of the data set as, as cases where the lane change was not successful. Um, maybe for good reasons, maybe for not. Uh, we filtered that out. Um, but we explicitly trained only on successes uh, because we want to have sort of a, a different controller um, not necessarily step in, but a different controller maintain, or a different part of the autonomy stack maintain safety uh, when we're surprised. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's the idea, that your high level planner um, is achieving a, a good de deal of performance, um, where I think that these edge cases, or the fact that you're not capturing the, in the uncertainty exactly right, um, if your tails are a little bit off, I think that's fine. Um, and then your tails are being addressed here by our safety controller. <coughs> Yeah, Zach. Um, do you think that these kind of methods will help a lot in in like all of the situations that autonomous cars will take, for example, are operating in, or is it only going to be on like very edge cases? Like specifically, you trained this variational autoencoder for the specific case where you're trying to, um, you know, go past each yeah. other. So do you think this is only useful in those like most extreme interaction cases, or do you think it'll be useful in all cases? And how would you do that in a, like, how will you generalize? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, I think that actually uh, we racked our brains to find a case of, of self-driving uh, behavior where it truly is interactive. In the sense that um, I think even the four-way stop, which some people interpret as interactive, or some people would sell as interactive, is once the decision has been made of who's going ahead, uh, the uncertainty is over. Um, and so I think that the the traffic weaving scenario is, in my mind, actually the, the the key example of really truly interactive behavior. And that's why we trained on that one in particular. Uh, actually, the places where I'm most optimistic about uh, you know applying this or generalizing this is to interaction outside of, of vehicles. Um, for example, home robots will need to, again, have some idea of how humans act uh, in order to actually, uh, yeah, you'll have to have some way to predict the future in order to actually make uh, good decisions. Um, 
And so there, yeah, I, I agree that generalizing this is tricky. Um, I think generalization uh, to different problems is, is always sort of a, a tough thing to do. Um, I speculate that, if, for example, you have a home robot and you're just observing the position of a human and modeling them as, for example, a single integrator. Um, you know, there's only so many situations in a home, and if you were, if you had quite as much surveillance of, of people's homes as you do uh, self-driving cars gathering data on the road, um, I think that you might be able to generate some pretty comprehensive models. Where again, the inputs are just uh, what has the robot been doing in the past couple of seconds, what does the robot want to do in the next few seconds, and what has the human been doing. And this is something that you could use again in, in a decoupled fashion to say, if this is my model of how humans are, are moving, then uh, I can have robots trying to accomplish all sorts of different tasks, reach all sorts of different places uh, of avoiding the human. Um, and here, in a, in a sense, I think that you can generalize to different robot tasks simply by this having, having the planning and modeling be decoupled like that. But yeah, I, I think that's a critical question. All right, I have a for your safety constraint uh, yeah. in the HAI, in the NPC problem, is so the reason why you only enforce the constraint for the first immediate action and not for like an extended duration that would guide you out of the epsilon region? <laughs> yeah, so I, I did a... Uh I did gloss over that. We actually apply it for the next 300th of a second. Why three? Um, because to do it too much longer makes your quadratic program a little bit too complicated to solve, at least on the computers that we're using. Uh, why not one? It is true that uh, there's definitely a lot of things that we're not quite modeling here. Like Even though I said that we have a really complicated uh, six-state bicycle model, um, and uh, we're combining that with a simple car model into a full seven-dimensional relative state, which, uh, for those of you that don't know, is, is very complicated for reachability. Reachability is usually applied on, on three or four dimensional systems. Um, what am I saying? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the, this, this seven state model actually doesn't capture everything. It doesn't capture slew rates or the idea that when you press on the brakes, there's actually a, it takes time for the fluid in the, in the cylinders to compress and actually, you know, there's a, a time delay for this action to appear. And so uh, similarly to adding this epsilon tolerance on your, on your linearization of your, of your value function, uh, you do want to actually keep uh, your constraint active for the next couple time steps. Um, but strictly speaking, mathematically speaking, you would only need to do it for the next one to say that my next state um, does not lie inside uh, the unsafe set. And of course, there's also inaccuracies brought about by linearization. Even if my dynamics were exactly, even if my nonlinear dynamics were exactly describing how the car moves, by turning it into a, a quadratic program, I am linearizing the error dynamics. Um, but yes, that, that is a idea that we do use, uh, and tuning that exactly and doing some math on that, uh, I think would also be an interesting. Uh, future research project. John. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm wondering how well your um, planner generalizes to some different merging geometries and if you have to retrain for every new geometry. That is a great question. Um, so I will tell you that we actually kind of already did, uh, in the sense that the, the data that we trained on, you can see um, from the video, looked like it was at highway speed. Uh, and it was about a, a four or five second interaction, so that when we took 1,000 trials, people wouldn't get too bored. Even though we, we swapped people out, but they did get very bored. Um, and so when we're actually putting this on X1, uh, we're, we're scaling the time by a factor of, of a half or two thirds. And so that has the effect of scaling your acceleration by the, the time scaling factor squared. So if you uh, slow things down by a factor of, of one half, your accelerations are actually quartered. And so that actually makes things kind of difficult to see uh, and interpret um, from like both the human and the robot side. Uh, and also, uh, we're, we're, we're lowering the speed, obviously, as well, because we don't want to be moving at 60 miles per hour uh, in a test. Um, so, it, like again, I think that to do things right, you would have to sort of retrain or train a more general model. Um, for that, I think you would also need more data. I think this data is something that will come to exist, or already does exist. I think I've heard the, the term, or the, the phrase, data is the new currency um, when it comes to machine learning, uh, where well, what you can do with regular currencies, you can buy data. <laughs> but again, what you really want is similar to, similar to a phenomenal logical approach. Like what you really want is you want the data to be able to learn from. Yeah, I think that you would have to retrain. Um, but we are applying this um, in, a, in a time scale geometry, but also the way that you would apply it to a, a sort of curvier merging scenario um, would just be to use, a, they're called Frenet coordinates for, uh, for roadways. Um, or if your road curves, you still have some notion of longitudinal distance and, and lateral distance um, within the lane that you can sort of map. Or that's what I would try, at least, is you would map this to 
uh, what you got going on. Again, I, I think for that, um, you really do want to have a good evaluation metric where uh, the reason why we say that our, our model is good is it has a good probabilistic fit. It has a good negative log likelihood score. Uh, but that's a function only of the model where I, I think I've harped on this entire talk where uh, the thing that actually matters is your whole combined system. It's combining all the pieces of the autonomy stack together. Um, and I think that uh, validating that or evaluating that is extremely expensive because uh, you do need humans in the loop or when you have these ar arbitrary scenarios, you do need more and more data. But I think this is what actual companies are doing is they're A-B testing their algorithms every day out there in the field um, where if they're gathering a lot of data and learning on a, different, a bunch of different scenarios, they can see which scenarios are insufficient and perhaps need a different modeling approach or need a different uh, planning approach as well. But I think what I'm trying to propose here is, is nothing, even though I, I focused on the talk uh, this idea of this traffic weaving scenario. Um, fundamentally what I'm doing is I'm saying I want to learn dynamics where the robot is, is you know, a key player in the dynamics model, and I want to, using reachability, um, ensure safety. But there's no, nothing is specific to either car scenarios or any of that. I think my committee wants to go home, so we should uh, wrap it up.